Franklin, um, we're not a normal publishing company by any means. Um, we're in the center of the conversation around things related to voice and AI. Two and a half years ago, we started a podcast network called Voice First FM. The website for that is voicefirst.fm. Um, our flagship podcast is called This Week in Voice. That show goes in seasons. I host it myself. Um, season three wrapped up a couple of months ago. Our guest on that show was Mark Cuban. Season four starts August 22nd, That's it, and the show is sponsored by Microsoft. Um, at this point in time, Voice First FM is listened to across 56 countries by, hundred, and by hundreds of thousands of people. Springing forth out of the podcasts is what we call the Voice First Events Series. So never say I didn't give you anything. <laughs> there you go. Um, so next week, we have we have uh, returning to Harvard Medical School is, is the number one event in voice and AI in modern healthcare. It's called the Voice of Healthcare Summit. That's part of a, a large series of events that we do. These two gentlemen will be speaking as part of the program. Matt, tell them who you are. All right, so Matt Sabolsky. I am been in healthcare for a long time. Started in finance. Was a med school professor at UAB. Um, started my own firm in 2016. I'm a trained psychologist. Uh, works quite well for voice, uh, for user experience, as well as influence, persuasion, adherence to meds, compliance with orders, and also getting people to adopt the technology. Like, how do you convince them to do it? Um, Bradley called me after I started my firm when he started his firm in 2016. We just started a podcast. And I said jokingly, that's what the analogy is in the 1980s dudes look at each other and go, let's start a band, man. Um, so I said, sure, because I was starting a consulting firm. I thought, all right, this was how we get some business. 100 downloads a month, 300, 5,000, 6,000, 10,000, 12,000 later, and we're sponsored, and we're the number one for healthcare and voice in the world. Um, we had Eric Topol on the show recently. We're going to have some really amazing folks speaking that know more than Dr. McClellan and I about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, I run a company called Ionia Healthcare Consulting. We have two vectors, consultant, right, which is patient safety, patient experience, just kind of your basic operational experience, you know, operational excellence. Second vector is developing voice first interfaces for healthcare. Uh, we're currently partnering with a firm out of the Midwest on a cardiology thoracic project. Um, Dr. McClellan and I are both really interested in that. Um, but that's my background. Uh, as a aside before Reed introduces himself, um, I've known these guys since I was a child. And it's kind of this fun little thing I like to tell people about, especially if we're in front of big crowds or we're speaking to folks. Like I've known Bradley since I was six or eight, and I've known Reed I think since I was 13. Uh, we all went our separate ways, and then we went and got way too educated, and then ended up being in the same world again. And thanks to Bradley, here we are. So nice to meet all of you. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Reed McClellan, I'm a pediatric plastic surgeon, so I deal with birth defects uh, at Harvard Medical and Boston Children's. Um, was trained there and then joined faculty there about two to three years ago. Uh, roughly the same time that I was doing that, I was seeing uh, a severe public health epidemic starting to rise, and that's called physician burnout. Uh, many physicians are tired of the documentations that we have to do and the amount of computering clicking that we have to do and so people are retiring. Uh, this is the first year ever that uh, it's actually been a decrease in the amount of students applying to medical school and we're also seeing a decrease in overall talent for for the medical school uh, because it's 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 right now difficult uh, to, to be a doctor and so I am um, I have a, a expertise in artificial intelligence, uh, and so I created an artificial intelligence company actually based in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and so my team's uh, there in, in Boston. So I split my time between Boston and uh, Chattanooga, focused on that because um, I always thought that was extremely important to assist basically the physicians and the patients, and we're hoping to bring it back to where there's an actual patient-physician or patient-doctor uh, relationship and interaction, which we probably all, as patients say, that you, that's kind of been lost over the past five to ten years. Uh, Bradley and Matt started the uh, podcast, and then I guess earlier this year uh, they approached me and uh, asked if I'd like to join in. I'd been a listener of it, and so I thought it was a great yeah, honor, uh, and uh, was really excited. So Matt, and I've done a few 
podcast uh, together on that, and then Matt and I work together on Voice First Technologies and the healthcare sector as well. Thank you all. So you're here to learn about voice. I hope you've had a good time today. Raise your hand if you've had a good time. So this is cool. I'm glad to see this in Nashville. So, you know, I toil away in Franklin. Nobody knows that we're there, um, except when we come up here. Uh, and and uh, it's a beautiful thing. Paul's put together a great conference. Voice. So it's important to know if you, if you don't leave with any other information that when people talk about the advances that are being made with voice technology, and when we talk about voice first, this term, what we're referring to is that voice um, is the way that we're going to be interacting with computers for the most part soon. It doesn't mean voice by itself. It doesn't mean voice only. It doesn't mean audio and no screen. It means voice with screens and a lot of them. Um, but what it means to say that technology is voice first means that rather than get the QWERTY keyboard out that somebody just made up one day and we started using and use a computer with that and the mouse, rather than get this thing out and swipe and tap on this um, and try to do something with the computer with that, we're going to use our voice first and then other things second. And the way it was explained to me is that um, when we're born, all we have is our mother's voice. These guys are going to get tired of hearing this. I'm already, already, already tired of hearing this. Oh, man. We're, we're, I start every sense. talk with this. Yeah, right. We, when we're born, all we have is our mother's voice. In the womb, outside of the womb. Then we develop, soon after that, an inner voice, which will guide us for the rest of our life. So it always stood to reason that as technology evolves over time, it will arc toward being voice driven or what we refer to as voice first. Now I wasn't smart enough to come up with that, but I am very smart enough to repeat it shamelessly. Um, and so when I heard that, I, I was in. You know, we started making some investments, doing some different things, and um, you know, and it's led to, to where we are now. It's, and so, it's great because it's a great analogy, honestly, as there's no training, right? Unless you have a um, disability, which thankfully most of us don't. No one has to tell you how to speak and listen. It's what you are innately built to do, and by the time you're five, six, seven years old, you know, you can put an echo dot in front of a child, and anyone's seen a child interact with these tools, they love it, they go bonkers, and they can control it, and it can spit out commands to them. Um, adults are the same way, I mean, especially the elderly, too. I mean, we have yeah. some folks at the conferences that come, and they do work specifically with people over a certain age, and how they've been able to reconnect with community, heal themselves, live longer, et cetera, is really remarkable. It, because it's who we are as human beings, that is what tells you that this is not a fad. So there's going to be questions about privacy. There's going to be questions about data security. You know, always those aren't going to go away. The reason why we are where we are is because Amazon, which is a company that is a customer-centric company, you can talk all day if you like them or not. But the reality is that. They have built their business on, you know, they put company after company out of business because they wanted to lower prices for the consumer. They put company after company out of business because they're trying to figure out how to get that widget to you or your groceries to you two, in two hours and then one hour and then 30 minutes and then five seconds. Their customer service is top notch. They'll just give you stuff if they you call them and there's a problem. Their whole company is built around customer being customer centric. Um, and because of that, they built up a lot of trust. And that is why people have allowed them to put Echo Dots or these black cylinders, you know, these listening devices, these surveillance technology in their house. If Facebook had done this, you think we'd be sitting here talking about this? Absolutely not. Hell no. No, no, no. You know, Google has a pretty good reputation, but it's not what Amazon's is. And um, so it's just important to note sort of how we got here. And if you listen to Jeff Bezos talk, in his shareholder letter or when he speaks publicly, he always says the same thing. Alexa is my number one priority, and I don't know what number two is for Amazon. Uh -huh. So two, two other takeaways I want to add to that with Bezos is also with Brian Romilly, who has been a featured guest on our podcast, as well as a lot of the work that Bradley's done with The Voice Project. He says two things that will kind of knock your socks off. Um, how many words do we use when we do a voice search versus type? 
seven times more words you speak versus type. And if data is more valuable than truffles in the economy of digital worlds, then that is a huge value to someone like an Amazon where they can hoard that data and then query against it. The second thing that'll blow your mind is if you have a cell phone and at least one smart speaker in the house, the average amount of microphones listening in your house at any given time, median, 50. There are eight mics per Echo Dot. Your cell phones have several. Um, if you have two people in the house, maybe a child or a relative, uh, it starts to become multiples. And that's listening all the time. They claim that it only records when you use the wake word, but you know there, there are some things maybe coming out that there might be some passive recording. So those two things blow my mind, right? That anywhere you go, there's microphones listening to you constantly. That's your future. Uh, I contract with a group, an architectural group out of Boston. They build hospitals now, rooms, with microphones and speakers designed into the walls, anticipating this future. So that's where we're at. I mean, if you don't have a digital strategy now for voice, you're behind. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. I'm gonna, I'll share one thing and I'll yeah. just yield the floor to y'all and mm -hmm. share your thoughts on this. Um, the point of this session is to essentially share things that we find interesting about what's going on in healthcare with this event coming up next week. Um, if you know somebody or you yourself are in healthcare, get on a plane and come to this. Uh, it will be time well spent. I'm going to ask both of y'all what the number one thing that you find exciting or most interesting about voice and AI is. But before that, I'll yield the rest of the time to you. But I want to share something that we didn't get to last session, which is that, you know, we live isolated and depressed lives thanks to technology thanks to social media. And national traffic. And national traffic. <laughs> yes, Children. please, yes. And um, we're, we're slaves to these in many ways. And voice has a lot to offer with all of that. But one thing I've always found interesting about voice and healthcare, there's two types of people that get more depressed and feel more lonely than anybody else. Any guesses to who they are? Clinicians? No, by age. Oh, the elderly? The older. Yeah. yeah. Senior citizens. But interestingly, people who get just as depressed as senior citizens are college freshmen. Oh, I can see that. I did not know this until recently. Yeah, but both those two groups are the high end of the curve. And um, and so, you know, they're disconnected. Uh, you know, they're both going through the same thing. They're in, they're in facilities where family's not around. Maybe family doesn't care about a period. They're adjusting into a new environment um, and they have no one to talk to. There's already been multiple studies that have shown that if you put Echo devices or Google Assistant devices or, or voice-oriented, voice-first technology into the room, they will start to converse with it. Um, they'll get real-time information from it um, and they will feel more connected and good outcomes immediately start happening better grades, less dropouts, less suicide for college freshmen, uh, better medical adherence, um, less death, better health outcomes for senior citizens. It's fascinating. That's a, that's something that we didn't get to last time, I just wanted to mention that. I'm done. Oh, I'll tell cool. you, you know, you know, you read, you go oh, read, and you get go. to this guy. Um, tell us something cool. We, we all been together for such a long time that we, we all talk a lot. Uh, so, I think that the number one, what was the most exciting thing right now in yeah. healthcare with voice uh, is, is twofold. First is actually Amazon. So when Bradley was uh, putting on the Alexa conference in Chattanooga back in January, a lot of people had questions because Alexa was not HIPAA compliant, did not have a BAA certificate, so nothing it could do could be really as a patient interaction at all, it had to be a client, so it was the privacy wasn't really there. There's a lot of concerns about Amazon listening and everything. It's one thing for us to give them their credit cards, one thing for us to give their entire health records, but with Amazon now moving to a HIPAA compliant server uh, group, I think we're going to see a tremendous uptick in voice-first technologies that are offered both to patients, not, cli not clients anymore, patients, and also to physicians. And uh, what's really exciting is that you guys here right now are right on the cutting edge. We're, it's not like you're behind, you're behind, and oh, I can never do anything. Amazon is, a, Amazon is just a platform. They're not, you won't be competing with Amazon, you'll just be using Amazon as an assistant or as, like I said, as the actual platform. 
for me, one of the biggest things I care about is the patient-doctor relationship. And where we really lost that was when we had to go behind the computer screens to enter in all the electronic health records and to find things on the electronic health records. So they're no longer papers, they're all e what we'll call EHRs, behind a computer screen. I have to click a thousand times before I can find the labs that you just had done and I've now taken my eyes off of you and now I'm looking at the computer screen. Right, actually right here in our backyard at Vanderbilt, they're leading the edge in voiced uh, assistance for uh, the different uh, EHR systems. There's two main ones, Epic and Cerner. And Yah Kumar Crystal, who will I think actually be at the Voice yeah. Healthcare Summit uh, next Monday and Tuesday, uh, is one of the leads on that. And she's done some great work and really excited to see how that can really integrate not only into Vanderbilt, but hopefully into Boston Children's where I am and to all the other uh, hospitals across the country. Matt, you're number one for voice and AI in healthcare now. All right, so um, there's some research going on at Carnegie Mellon on microphones and audio where they can splice up with high accuracy, tell you things like what appliances you have in your house, how many times the toilet is flushed, how many liters of water leave the house. There's claims that they can, uh, and I don't mean to be crass, we're talking about clinical outcomes. Um, there are claims that they can tell the density of urine output based on the sound it makes. And therefore, someone has CHF, COPD, if these microphones that I mentioned all in the house listening to that, can be reported right back in the medical record. You're hydrated, you're not hydrated, eat less salt. Um, we know how much you're using the restroom during the day. We know you're not taking enough water or you're drinking too much water. They can hear faucets coming on and off. Um, of course, you would want someone to say, I assent to that, right? I consent to this uh, stuff. Uh, but to me, that is a wonderful tool. Instead of me going into the doctor's office once a quarter and reporting how I'm doing, which I probably fib about, uh, being recorded regularly and having someone say, hey, uh, not to intrude too much, but I've noticed you're not really, uh, you're using the bathroom too much, or you're taking on too much water, or you're eating too many bags of potato chips at night. Uh, because we can hear that, I think is a really exciting thing to me, is about behavior change and getting people out of a chronic condition habit of eating poorly or drinking too much water or too much salt. Uh, those are the things that got me really, really excited about voice. Yeah. Questions about anything? Questions about... I consider myself a, a visual learner, sure. and so how does that balance out if we move toward this audio teaching and processing society? You'll never get rid of screens, and you're not ever going to get rid of like indicators. So do you have an Echo Dot at home? I do. You ever see it do the little yellow spinner or like the blue spinning white? So it notifies you something's going on. That's a visual cue. Echo 5, the Echo Show that came out, right? There's always a screen involved. If you do a flash briefing, for example, NPR, Reuters, it'll show you little news clips in the morning. Um, we might reduce the footprint of a screen. I don't think it'll ever go away because of But you said compensation is what I was wondering. So I consider that, like, if you were to say, hey, I need to teach you how to do something, would you rather read it or do you want to tell you how to do it? Uh -huh. I would rather re read it. Yeah. That's what I mean. Uh -huh. So then we, we start learning to compensate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you? There's some great but stuff. Bradley could speak to the education. Actually, I think I yeah. chose to be a visual learner. Yeah. Right. Did I? I don't know. Well, I thought it was a <laughs> I don't know. How did that make you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Bradley already mentioned uh, this at the beginning. It's voiced first technology, meaning that you start with your, you do the voice command, but it's still made. Anyone, anyone who's in here can read faster than we can listen. Than we can listen to Alexa talk back to us. So, like, if I say a command, I, I may still look at the computer or whatnot, but instead of having to click twenty-five times to get there, I'm uh, it, it pulls it pulls directly. Up. So, so here's a use case. Have you ever used uh, Echo Show, for example, for like, recipes? Have you ever cooked with it? Try it. Try it. Just say, how do I cook a spaghetti sauce, for example? It'll show you pictures and read and tell you at the same time. And you can even scroll through, yeah. right, and look through the directions. Bradley and I did a study for MedTech Boston recently with, with medicine where we just asked pharmaceutical names, both brands and generics. Um, the feedback from the screen we got was really wild. Sometimes it would give you a description of what the medicine was, its, it's molecular structure, and how it was uh, dosed. And then sometimes it would have an error, and in one case it, it gave us an image of a hamster when we asked about like diphenhydramine or acetaminophen or something, and we both cracked up laughing. But we're so early stage that sometimes these things fail, but it's not to be lost that the visual cues tend to go along with the audio ones. Yeah. I definitely have one more thing to add real quick to that, is that don't lose sight of the fact that um, you know the screens are always gonna be there, but also what Alexa, Google Assistant, Siri, Cortana, Bixby, all these things are, 
is they're the front door to AI and machine learning. Yeah. So what's happening is your computer is going to know you better than you know you soon, if it doesn't already. And there will be things like, um, for pod people in podcasting, as an example I use just because it's easy. If you're, right now the way you interact with Alexa is you push a button or you say Alexa and you tell it something and then it regurgitates something back to you. That's going to go away. Instead, what's going to happen is it's just going to tell you things when it feels like telling you things. Now, yeah, you're going to opt in. But if you do opt in, it has a ton of ability. And, you know, I just use Alexa as an example. AI will have a, a profound ability to change your life. Google just over the summer rolled out something called Google Duplex. They spooked a lot of people with this and set it back. <laughs> but forget that a moment. You'll be able to uh, basically tell Google and Google's AI, um, every three weeks I go to some hair salon and I need an appointment that's at 7.30 in the morning. Um, and if that's not available, then 4 p.m. will work. Um, and if there's bad weather, then I need to reschedule for the next day. Unlimited parameters. It'll call for you, talk to the human being on the other end, make the appointment, put it on the calendar, change it if necessary, as necessary, and, and done. And scheduling will completely change. Didn't they do a reservation example at their conference? They, they did. They, when they rolled it out, they showed it, and people got real upset because you couldn't tell that you weren't speaking to a human. Oh, okay. We're at time. We're at time. Oh. So anyway. Uh